In this lesson, I'll teach you some of the essential techniques that are required to become adept with the brushes in your digital art application. Some of these techniques involve gestures, while others utilize the behavior of the brush, shape, and media. I'll demonstrate on a light gray canvas. The simplest technique is dabbing the brush. I'll choose a brush with a distinct shape and scale it larger. Then I'll press my pen firmly against the tablet. Some brushes will instantly make a dab, but others may require you to hold the pen down for a while, and maybe even wiggle the pen slightly to build up the opacity. In this case, my dab is created by the shape of the brush. Depending on the properties of the brush, you may be able to control the shape, grain, size, and opacity of the dab using pressure or other expressions. You can watch my reference video about expressions to learn more. You can use dabs side by side to create a pattern, or you can overlap them to create a more intricate dab. You can combine dabs like this to create trees and other types of fractal shaped objects. Clicking with your mouse is the easiest way to create a single dab at a time. This can be useful to prevent your brush medium from building up too rapidly. A step up from dabbing is making a stroke. The stroke based techniques will require a drawing tablet. When you press your pen to the tablet and then move it, the brush dab repeats, creating a stroke. There are numerous ways you can create that stroke depending on the direction, length, pressure, velocity, and other expressions that you use. Overlapping strokes can also change the look of the marks that you get. This brush uses grain, so I have control over the pattern I get within the strokes. Let's look at some of the techniques you can use with strokes. Next, I'll select a round hard edge brush with sized link to pressure, and then create a stroke that goes from heavy to light. How quickly you draw your strokes can affect their appearance, as well as your ability to control the stroke. If you create a stroke with a slow velocity, chances are the stroke width is not going to transition smoothly from thick to thin. But if you draw your stroke quickly, with some practice you should be able to taper the ends of the strokes. A tapered stroke is essential for creating hair, grass, branches, and many other objects. It's also useful for fading opacity in a stroke, and for creating ink outlines. In addition to varying the brush size and opacity with pressure, you can also vary blending, grain, and other useful properties. Next, let's try some techniques for working with opacity. I'll select a soft airbrush and use a large size. If I paint firmly and then gradually decrease pressure, I'm able to build up the opacity and then fade it out to create a gradient. You could think of this as a long overlapping stroke that slowly tapers off. I can also select another color and blend these two colors together by using opacity link to pressure. To learn more about the opacity property, see my reference video on that topic. Let's take a look at another technique that utilizes opacity called glazing. This is a traditional art technique. I'll open the glazing face template and I'll choose a glazing brush. In your art application, glazing brushes might be called something else. In Krita, the glazing property is called wash. Glazing brushes in digital art are defined by their ability to overlap a single stroke without the opacity building up unless you increase your pressure or end the stroke. At a low opacity, these work well for adding a thin glaze over underlying paint. Another way to use them is with a high opacity, using pressure to get different values rather than changing your color. For example, I can select the fill layer and enable lock transparency. Now I can select either black or white to add form to the face using pen pressure to control the opacity. This is just rough shading for demonstration's sake, but it shows you how you can create a lot of detail just by utilizing pen pressure to change the color value. As you can see, I can create my artwork in grayscale and then add color later using glazing techniques. If you'd like to see more of this technique, I have a lesson about glazing a grayscale landscape painting. Next, I will open the Glow template and we'll take a look at another opacity building technique using a glow brush. A glow brush is a brush that is set to the blending mode of screen or something similar like color dodge. When you overlap strokes, the color builds up lighter to create a glowing light effect. I'll choose a darker color that matches the hue of one of my stars, and if I paint on a layer that is also set to screen, I can create a glowing halo around the star. I can use pen pressure to modulate the opacity, and I can lift my pen and make more strokes to build up the glow. If I make my brush smaller, that can help the light look more concentrated in the center. And then to feather out the glow, I can use a larger brush. Working back and forth between large and small will give you the best results. 
If the glow is building up too slowly for you, choose a brighter color. Another way to use glow is with a fine brush to create rim highlights on an object. I'll load the pencil template, and let's take a look at a dry media technique that utilizes pressure to control opacity. I'll choose a grainy pencil brush that supports the tilt expression. A 2B pencil in Corel Painter or the tilted pencil in Krita are a couple of examples. The shape of this brush should elongate when you tilt your pen. I'll select a dark gray color, and if I sketch with this brush upright, I can vary the opacity of my pencil marks using pressure. I can also tilt my pen to simulate shading with the side of a pencil. In addition to widening the dab, it further reduces the opacity, so now I can more easily build up gradients like I could with the airbrush. Overlapping several strokes will build up the pencil darker. Choosing a lighter or darker gray and adjusting the grain or paper strength can help simulate various degrees of pencil hardness. You can also add color to the pencils and blend them together. Next, I'll share some techniques for freehand drawing curves and lines. I'll select a hard edge round brush that is fully opaque with size linked to pressure. Most art apps have a brush like this. In Clip Studio Paint, it's called a pen. I want to mention that I am working on a fairly large 27 inch display tablet. If you're working on a tablet that is very small, it's going to be more difficult to make these gestures because you need a lot of room to move your arm. Let's start with a straight line. I'm going to try to keep my wrist and elbow locked, and I will draw using my elbow as the axis of motion. I'm not drawing using my wrist, I'm not drawing using my fingers, it's all in the elbow. Don't focus on what you're doing with your pen, just concentrate on getting the gesture right. Once you get the arm movement down, begin to work on the velocity of your stroke. You want to make a fluid, fast stroke so that the line doesn't have time to wobble. Once you get the hang of it, you should be able to draw fairly straight lines. For curves, the arm movement is the same. You want to draw from your elbow. A medium velocity works best to get a smooth curve. With some practice, you may even be able to draw freehand ellipses. Another way to draw curves is to plant the ball of your wrist on the tablet surface and use it to constrain the movement of your line. As you can see, the pen is on the tablet, but my motion is constrained around the axis of my hand. You can also segment your lines if that works better for you. In fact, sometimes it looks better stylistically if your line isn't completely solid. Rotating your canvas or tablet can also help you draw at a more comfortable angle. Let's move on to explore some of the techniques I use when working with textured brushes, such as chalk or sponges. I'll load the Primitive Shapes template and choose a chalk brush. Many art apps have a brush like this. It can be any shape, but it needs to have an eroded dab with a lot of fine holes in it. Next, I'll select the front side of the cube. I'll lock the transparency of the layer. This is often found in the Layers panel and can sometimes be called Lock Alpha or Preserve Alpha. Then I will paint with very light pressure so that the texture builds up slowly. If I want the texture to be stronger in some areas, I can use firmer pressure and overlap strokes to build it up. You can also layer up multiple textures. I'll select this green pattern that looks cracked. If I put some of that on top, it helps the texture look less repetitive. I can use the same techniques with a sponge brush on the top of the cube. I'll use light pressure to lightly add texture or heavier pressure to make the texture stronger. What I am doing here is letting the shape of the brush and the grain create the texture for me. I just need to decide where I want it and how strong I want it to be. Now let's take a look at some blending techniques. Blending can be broken down into a few different techniques. Blurring, mixing, diffusion, smudging, and scattering, with many blenders utilizing more than one of these techniques. I'll load the distance template and I'll select a blur blender. In your art application, this might be in the Blenders category, or it might be considered an effects brush. What we are looking for is a brush that only blurs pixels when you paint over them. I'll blend the background layer to set it back into the distance. This creates a sense of focal depth. If your blend is too strong, you may be able to reduce the strength by lowering the opacity of the brush. I'll reset the brush to its original strength. Next, I'll load the Blenders template and select a wet or water blender. This type of brush just mixes the color together, creating an intermediate color. This type of brush might also blend to transparency. If so, you could use this to soften the edges of paint to make it look wet. These types of blenders are great for working with wet media like watercolor. 
For a blend that is more dry and grainy, we can try diffusion style blending. The brush you want is a round brush that has a noisy dab with very fine speckles. Blur Diffuser in Corel Painter or the Soft Noisy Brush in Rebel are some examples. In Corel Painter, Diffusion scatters the pixels to mix them up, and this creates an intermediate color. This is a proper diffusion. Rebel is sort of faking the effect. If you use a very light touch, you can lightly fuzz up the paint, or you can use heavier pressure for a stronger mixing of the pixels. I'll return to the Distance template. Another way to use blenders is to smudge or pull the pixels. You can use this to make your blending look oily or to create bristly looking effects like hair or grass. I'll select a smudgy blender with a speckled or rake shaped dab. I'll pull upward on the edge of the grass layer to make multiple individual grass blades in a single stroke. Changing the shape of your dab will change the shape of the streaks. Depending on your art application, you might even be able to add grain to these types of blenders to change the smudging pattern even more. The final blending technique is scattering, which is sort of a mix between smudging and diffusion. Not many art applications support this, but Corel Painter is one that does. I'll load the blenders template, and I'll select the speckle diffuser brush. As you can see, this brush creates a lot of small dabs that scatter the pixels. Unlike diffusion, which has a static shape, Scattering is more dynamic and can utilize grain and particle movement. One thing to be aware of is how blenders affect the edges of paint on a layer. For example, in Rebel, the soft noisy blender will pull in paint unexpectedly onto the blank part of the canvas. If I blend in the middle of the layer, everything is fine. But as soon as I blend near the edges, paint appears in the center of the cursor, which ruins the edge. This doesn't happen with the custom brush I created called Grainy Blender. Instead, I can blend near the edge and nothing happens. I'll blend the edge of the paint out to transparency to show you what I'm trying to accomplish. The difference is that the first brush is based on a blender tool, and the second brush is using a blend mode. For whatever reason, the blend tool behaves this way, so if you're getting unexpected results, you might see if there is more than one way to make a blender in your art application. If you are stuck with this type of blending, then just avoid the edges while using blenders or start the stroke inside the layer and blend outward. Another consideration is that if the transparency of your layer is locked, you can't pull paint out to the blank areas of the canvas. But in some applications, you might be able to pull transparency into the paint if you start your stroke outside the layer. There you have it, some essential techniques to use with your digital art brushes. Practice a lot, and these techniques will become second nature to you.